Hello and welcome back once again to Rage Gaming and today, Last Epoch. We're talking about a fantastic looking ARPG that's actually been around for quite some time, but is finally releasing fully with its 1.0 version, February 21st. I'm coming at this from a perspective of an off and on ARPG player who finally committed properly to one as my main game, which was Diablo 4. An unfortunate choice, because that game has comical issues with its end game, builds and class balance, or should I say even function of some of them. There's this painful lack of quality of life in that game for a long-term player. So if you're like me, who's found Diablo 4 left you wanting a bit more depth and detail with interesting systems that are actually worth investing that kind of time, you might have looked at Path of Exile, and of course also Last Epoch. Path of Exile is the other end of the spectrum though. PoE goes super in-depth and complicated nigh on instantly, boasting one of the most involved and interesting ARP experiences currently. I really like that game. The problem though, is that with over 10 years of system bloat and depth, it is very overwhelming to try to understand or apply things properly as a new player. PoE's new player experience is commonly agreed to be pretty intimidating and unfortunate. A major point of its sequel then, Path of Exile 2, is to take those incredible systems and make them much easier to approach and understand, but without losing that insane depth at the back end. But what if you wanted something, yes, richer and more satisfying in depth compared to Diablo 4, with thought out designs that engage an end game ARPG player's interests, without going over the top and being too much at once, this seems to be where Last Epoch stands, that kind of middle ground between the overly casual and limited Diablo 4 and the overly intense and involved PoE. A stepping stone into a deeper, proper experience after, say, trying Diablo 4. That's what it seems to be aiming to be, and based on the reviews and opinions of others going into 1.0, it sounds like they've achieved that after a long period of working at it. Like I said, Last Epoch has actually existed for some time now, originally kickstarted through crowdfunding back in 2018, then made available in its early access as a beta in 2019, and the game's had a lot of kind of pushbacks for its 1.0 release that is now finally happening. The devs have been very direct and receptive to even harsh feedback about the state of the game. It did have a lot to improve on back in 2019. But refreshingly, the devs have continually listened and added and improved upon these core systems, refining things to a point that they not only work fantastically, but it's kind of what you're looking for in this genre. So it's not until now that they're actually happy with the game and ready to release it fully and go from there. So let's talk about this promising game and some of those cooler details you're going to want to know, starting with the class and build systems. As you can see, originally there are five base classes. These then kind of ascend to their masteries, which are essentially their true class options of the game. So the five base classes originally are Mage, Rogue, Primalist, Acolyte, and of course Sentinel. But these then progress into three different mastery picks for each, so 15 masteries in reality. So let's cover all of those options. There's this really cool graphic that kind of explains it. So at the top here, we have the Sentinel, which can become either a Forge Guard, a Void Knight, or a Paladin. You've got the Acolyte with Lich, Necromancer, and Warlock. The Primalist can choose between Shaman, Beastmaster, and Druid. You've got Rogues with the Blade Dancer or Marksman, so melee range version. And the brand new in 1.0, so it's not actually available in the game right now, is the Falconer that's coming with the launch. And then finally, we have the Mage with Rune Master, Spellblade, and Sorcerer as your classic pick. You want to be aware then before you actually pick one of these is that it's a permanent choice. So a little research on this topic for the class that you're interested in and which of the mastery options you're going for is definitely going to be worth that effort. This says nothing of the massive range of build options and potential within all of these. So let's talk about that. So what we're looking at here is just a kind of random build website for Last Epoch. This allows me to look at lots of different details, do a build planner, pick my class or whatever. So we've got the mastery for Sentinel Void Knight here. And what I want to talk about is the skill options. As you can see, I can click down here and choose from the different skills available to this class. And this is where it gets very interesting. Let's say I take Lunge. Now I have Lunge as a skill, but it comes with its own skill tree because every ability in this game does. So initially, Lunge is just kind of a dash to nearby enemy and strike it with your weapon. Our first three choices might be a bit more bland. You gain a percentage of missing health when you use Lunge. This final hit has a chance to apply frailty, or you reduce Lunge's remaining cooldown. Much like Diablo 4's skill tree system, you're getting a couple basic options that slightly enhance how it works, but nothing too interesting. But this is a skill tree rather than, you know, just two options like in Diablo 4. So in this case, I could go down this route and turn myself unstoppable, completely invulnerable to damage 
during a lunge. I could go down a different element route. So with Torchbearer, I convert the physical damage to fire instead, scaling it with fire damage stuff rather than physical damage. And it even converts bleed chance into ignite chance, you know, fire over time. I could go with Tyria to make it more of a supportive thing so I can lunge to an ally instantly or change the nature of how the ability even works in terms of the radius, dealing damage in a kind of extended rectangle rather than a circle around you. Each of these skills has their own skill tree that you can level up and each kind of route that you take kind of leans into a different build concept. And aside from the skills in their skill trees, of course, you actually have your class and those kind of passives. What we're looking at here is the base sentinel. And so you've got points that you can spend in the base sentinel. And as you can see, that progresses the skill bar for that, unlocking new options as we progress. Now, obviously, as we were talking about in that example, we were looking at the Void Knight. So specifically for that mastery, we have Void Knight related things that we can spend. We spend points, we progress, we unlock new things as we go. But you might think that Paladin and Forge Guard, because I pick Void Knight, night is something we can't access. Really coolly, that's not true. We can take things from the Paladin and the Forge Guard despite being a Void Knight. But the difference here is there's this kind of chain in the middle that blocks progress. I can only get everything on the left side of that chain as we progress over to it. As you can see, I can't actually go beyond it. I can keep spending points on the side, but I can never get to these things. Only a Paladin has access to that. And the same for Forge Guard. So whatever mastery you end up picking, that'll be your main focus where you can get the end game options for that but you'll still be able to get important points from your Sentinel and then say your other masteries that you didn't pick. So quite a lot of options there too. Now with this level of depth to the skills you might be using, it might be calling into question whether this is really complicated and you're gonna need a build plan when you go in. If you've played Path of Exile, you might expect to need one. In that game, you absolutely do need a build guide that you're following just to function. Because in that game, it's kind of a matter of time before when you're doing it blindly, you make a choice, you can't go back on, or maybe it's just a massive pain to, you know, fix resulting in nigh on the inability to function in the end game when you get there. That is a dangerous thing. But thankfully, compared to this, you're not going to need a guide in Epoch. They are a lot more forgiving. As long as you have a base understanding of ARPGs, or at least willing to consider your current options properly, you should be more than fine. We have got complex options and depth to each class, and obviously even its abilities, but there isn't quite nearly as punishing a system compared to PoE. If you do want to follow guides and builds while you're just starting out, that's completely fine and maybe a good idea. But if you want to truly make your own build and test things yourself, well, you absolutely can. Next, let's talk about their absolutely fantastic crafting system. What I'm used to in Diablo 4 is having an item that I found and it has like different affixes and I can pick one that I can re-roll for true RNG and also pretty hefty resource costs. I won't be doing that very early. I'll be doing that very late because I have to go do specific content specifically in the end game before I'm able to do that. This just laughs at that. There's a lot of types of items in this game. Commons or greys, your blue magic items, yellow rares, orange uniques, pretty standard stuff. But we also have set pieces, which are green. You get bonuses based on how many items you're wearing in said set. There's also exalted purples and kind of a red or pink legendary, which are formed by combining items, which yet yeah, is done much later in the game. So it's not like you're using one type of item with a couple of uniques slapped in there, as you might normally see in Diablo 4. But the quality of these items decides, you know, how many affixes it has. So that's how many suffixes, how many prefixes, what you can do with manipulating that and crafting Crafting. crafting plays a huge role then in properly setting this all up without nearly as much painful RNG. Crafting immediately lets you take an early game item and just slap on a suitable affix, change or improve the current ones, all limited by, you know, the quality of the item to set how many you can mess with, as well as something called forging potential, limiting how much you can continuously mess with one item. We'll start engaging with this way earlier by comparison, in the leveling, whenever, because you can open up this forge system wherever you are. So items have their affixes coming in prefixes or suffixes that are determined by the quality of the item. Generally, the higher the quality, the more potential options you'll have. Now, crafting lets you slap on anything you might need. There's literally a search bar. Maybe you need health or resistances, which is probably going to be a common thing as we're leveling anyway. And we just use crafting to help bump those numbers up that might be lacking or just further our specific DPS. The materials and the forging potential will limit how far you can go with this, but at very least with basic beginner items, it's going to help us get specific stuff that we need for passives. Now I could go in depth with this system explanation for long term. I'll say the affixes could be higher tiers, so higher quality, or there's things like glyphs to 
modify what might happen on the next craft or runes to remove and change say specific affixes or just RNG a bunch of random ones on there, shatter the item to break it down and get the materials. Crafting here is a deep and involved system that's actually going to be very useful to a new player as well as being a fantastic long term system for an end game player to perfect an item as that long term goal. Speaking of key features that should always be included in a game like this, yes last epoch is launching with a loot filter. What's neat about this one though is how it's all in game. Even PoE has to at least go to their website and select options there. But loot filters are this vital component of any ARPG. As soon as you try one you're going to struggle to live without one. Instead of checking every item that ever drops you just set a filter. Don't show me commons, I don't want them. Show me only items that are, I don't know, yellow quality or higher, that have physical damage, health, element resistances, or whatever specific thing I'm looking for on them. Now if I see a drop, I know it's got at least one of those on, meaning it's worth checking and seeing. You don't then have to pick up every item you ever see drop, check if it's relevant manually, usually it's not. It's just an annoying thing to worry about in an ARPG where you're constantly being bombarded with loot. Having a filter to manage that so that you only see things that are relevant to you to me is a bare minimum feature for the genre, so it's baffling that Diablo 4 launched without it and still doesn't. And also while we're on the topic, there's the stash or bank in this game. It lets you have up to 200 dabs, just increased by spending in-game currency to get a new tab. 200 is so much more than remotely needed that we shouldn't ever struggle for space in any normal gameplay because it's stupid and annoying to have to. Of course, it also comes with tons of filters and tabs you can create to manage all your items and type of relevance to you with a search bar and everything you might need. And there's wonderful quality of life features like a button called transfer crafting items, instantly sending all the materials, taking up space into storage or a sort items button that will organize your inventory for you beyond awkwardly meshing things with poor spacing but you know properly logically sorting it so not a single slot is wasted it basically does the tetris management for you so overall the inventory systems and quality of life means you're going to be spending way less time in this game worrying about organization and managing loot especially mid grind which is a vital quality of life feature i also wish diablo 4 would learn from for one last major topic i do want to reference the end game but i'm not going to touch on it massively just know the devs are aware that in a game of this nature that's where most of the game should be once you beat the main story you'll get access to the different activities meant for this purpose there's things like the insane monolith of fate option which allows you to do this kind of time traveling to fight targets from other timelines. There's the classic dungeon systems, but where they're all with their own unique theme and layout with modifiers that are going to challenge you in different ways, like something as simple as a time limit to beat. They've of course got scaling difficulty, but with that they increase the reward as you kind of progress and start to make it harder and harder. So the end game is absolutely there, but I want to properly understand and try it myself before I talk about it properly in a video. The only other last thing I want to mention that definitely deserves one is the very kind entry cost. We can buy the game on Steam for roughly $35, which is half the price of Diablo 4, and then they're probably promising some pretty incredible things long term with that in mind. Future updates and DLC will simply be included with the game you've already bought. They won't be charging us another $70 every year it's just buy the game you've got the game and the things they're gonna add as they continue to support it and i think that's pretty great but yeah that's my little talk about last epoch and some of the awesome things about it i didn't even get into things like their trading system or any ultra in-depth topics i have a lot to learn myself as a new player too so i'm excited to just get into it with 1.0 if you guys have any details you do want to share that we didn't cover because of that then then feel free to drop it in the comments but for now i've been hollow you've been new thanks for watching and i'll see you next time Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye